couple of weeks ago, I caught a couple of vids, poor or worst places in Kentucky, Appalachia. You get the picture, pun intended. Most likely, these creators ain't from around these parts. The vids weren't balanced at all, and it kind of rubbed my fur the wrong way, so to speak. All I will say is, birthday cake served with the frosting side down, it, it's the same cake, but maybe the intent is clear. If you're watching this video for the shock and awe of hillbilly poverty, maybe you will be disappointed. Is there poverty here? Sure is. Is there a drug problem here? Sure is. Just like almost anywhere else I've been in the United States. The difference here is the people. Somewhere about 1976 or so, I stumbled upon a book, John Fetterman's Stinking Creek, The Portrait of a Small Mountain Community. This isn't the Senator John Fetterman. Most of my childhood was spent about 20 miles or so from Stinking Creek. I went to high school with these kids. Barberville, or Barville as some know it, my hometown. My family was one of the first 60 families to settle in Kentucky, just after 1796. Barberville used to be vibrant, alive. There was a five and a dime with hot roasted nuts, Hampton and Now clothing. Miss Now was the Spanish teacher. There was a theater and other family-run businesses all around the courthouse square. My buddy Pat Gooden's family, they owned the Oasis Pizza Parlor. A lot of Pac-Man went down there. Now it's crumbling, decaying, dying. The cold industry has burned out. No one grows tobacco anymore. The fields and the barns, they're empty. The only thing flourishing here today are the lawyers, like vultures on Himalayan possums. Black lung, SSI, disability, car wrecks. Like they say, 99% of all lawyers give the other 1% a bad name. And these are just some of the lawyers on Main Street and the Courthouse Square. Black Lung, SSI, Disability, Car Wrecks. So what is, where is Appalachia, you ask? It's a mountain range and basin that stretches from Vermont and New York down through Kentucky and Tennessee, continuing on the way down to Alabama and Mississippi. Today, 2024, about 26 million people live in Appalachia, but whenever the media or the politicians want to focus on poor Appalachians or hillbillies, it seems the hills and the hollers of West Virginia and Kentucky are the favorited targets. Clay County in Kentucky has a poverty rate of about 38%. McDowell County, West Virginia stands near 38%. These counties have the distinction of being the poorest of the poor. The hillbilly, Appalachia, and Kentucky have been maligned since the beginning. Edgar Allan Poe, in his Tale of the Ragged Mountains, describes the area as the chain of wild and dreary hills that lie westward and southward of Charlottesville, a reference to the modern and enlightened New York City of the time. Poe called out the inhabitants as uncouth and fierce races of men, and that stereotype sometimes persists today. In 1964, Life magazine published a special 12-page feature, The Valley of Poverty. In a lonely valley in eastern Kentucky, in the heart of the mountainous region called Appalachia, live an impoverished people whose plight has long been ignored by affluent America. Their homes are shacks without plumbing or sanitation. Their landscape is a man-made desolation of corrugated hills and hollows laced with polluted streams. The people themselves, often disease-ridden and unschooled, are without jobs and even without hope. 
government relief and handouts of surplus food have sustained them on a bare subsistence level for so many years that idleness and relief are now their accepted way of life. It was 1964 that President Johnson boarded his Air Force One helicopter and flew into Martin County, Kentucky, Inez. His goal? To find a poster boy for his war on poverty. Typical of this group is Tom Fletcher, his wife and eight children. Fletcher, an unemployed sawmill operator, earned only $400 last year and has been able to find little employment in the last two years. Imagine, you are a 38-year-old unemployed coal miner minding your own business on the front porch of your cabin on Rockcastle Creek, and the most powerful man in the world just walks up and spends 35 minutes with you discussing your plight. As President Johnson walked away, he declared, I have called for a war on poverty. Our objective is total victory. Here and now declares unconditional war on poverty in America. After Johnson left, there was fruit for a few years. Kind-hearted people sent donations to Martin County. Tom took a training program to become a mechanic, for which he also received $42 a week. And this money wasn't wasted right away. He bought new teeth for both himself and his wife, Nora, who was also his first cousin. And what is it that they say about fate? Fate is the hand of cards that you are dealt, and choice is how you play that hand. Well, for Tom, one bad thing just led to another. The economy in the area worsened. He broke his leg. He became ill. Nora, his first wife, had died of breast cancer. But Tom, 60 years of age in 1986, married then 19-year-old Mary Porter, some 40 years his junior. Alas, six years later in 1992, Tom, 66 years old, could still be found on his front porch, though now drawing a much more respectable sum of $282 a month. But trouble, trouble had a way of finding poor Tommy. He found himself and his young bride in jail for attempting to kill their four-year-old son, Tommy Jr. Sadly, this fact only came to light after their 18-month-old daughter, Ella Rose's body was exhumed, the result of Tommy Jr.'s convulsions while in a head start. Conclusion, overdose, propoxyphene poisoning the same as Tommy Jr. At least, Mrs. Fletcher was able to explain exactly what had happened. She just wanted to collect on the burial insurance policies, she told the police. Her statement, we just needed the money because we's fixing up the house, putting in a bathroom and water in and everything. In 1994, an Associated Press reporter interviewed Mr. Fletcher, still on his front porch, 30 years later. I'm getting tired of it, Fletcher said. After all this time, I think they would be letting it go by now. Poor Tom died in 2004 at 78 years of age. There are nice homes here, beautiful homes, where you can have a beautiful life. And then, there are abandoned houses. And I wonder, what happened to these people, this life that once lived there? Just past Rock Hassle Creek is Little Laurel Creek. It's a quiet little road where you can hear the chickens and the crows peaceful.
the day after Tommy Fletcher met and welcomed the President of the United States onto his porch, someone read the account from the newspapers to Tommy, who could not read, where the reporters had described Fletcher's small home as flimsy, ramshackle, and a tar paper shack. This offended Fletcher, as he thought his house was in fairly decent shape. And you can still find the occasional log cabin, homestead in these hollers if you look. Most have been abandoned. Kids have moved away. In about 1966 or so, I think, there was a used car salesman. He started making mobile homes down near Knoxville or Maryville, Tennessee, trailers, and began populating the hills of Appalachia with them. He sold that company maybe 20 years ago to Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, for a, a about two billion, maybe. It really doesn't matter, though. Log cabin, brick home, or a Clayton mobile home. It takes money to maintain property. And with the decline of coal and tobacco, and the lack of industry, not just the homes, but the businesses and business properties fall into decline. Without the mines or logging industry, the mom and the pop grocery stores, they sit abandoned. Even the IGA, downtown Inez, sits idle, the parking lot empty. The buildings downtown, falling victim to the steady advance of time and the lack of upkeep and maintenance. This building was for sale when President Johnson visited back in 1964. Today, the roof is slowly collapsing, echoing the economy of Martin County and Appalachia. Sure, there are jobs here. Martin County politicians spent $6 million of coal severance taxes to build this business center, to lure high-tech industry and businesses to this town of maybe 500 folks. One man in Martin County understands what the government doesn't. A self-made millionaire, he alone at one time employed about 1,400 people in Martin County. 1,400 or so people that wanted to work. That's about 41% of the people, the working people here. 60 years since the beginning of this war, Appalachia is dying. The generals, the politicians in this war they don't understand their enemy. And you can't say there are no jobs here. That just isn't true. The question is, is there opportunity? Indeed.com lists almost 600 unfilled jobs in Martin County. But Appalachia, as some portray, is not all Clayton mobile homes and abject poverty. Some people make choices with the hands they're dealt. And some people 
choose to leave. Kermit, West Virginia, just across the Tug Fork River from Inez and Warfield, Kentucky, the population stands at 217, a one-year decline of 13% from 2021. The poverty rate in that same year, a 9% increase to 33.6%. The per capita income here is about $19,000. Some people who've never been to the mountains ask, what is a holler? And I think this picture explains it perfectly. Like Old Yaller, a holler is what the mountain people called a hollowed out area between the mountains. Usually, this is the only flat land available to build on. Many times, the families in these hollows, they are all related. Some having been here since the coal caps of the 40s and 50s. Others not wanting a life in the mines or in the poverty when coal started dying, fled to the industrial cities of the north, Detroit, Dayton, Chicago, Cincinnati, to seek their fortunes and to raise their children. But it is a double-edged sword. The cost of living here in the mountains is cheap compared to other places. But salary alone somewhere else can be three or four times what you can earn here not to mention retirement. And many people who left Kentucky and West Virginia in the 60s and 70s retire here comfortably. Today, those mighty machines that once helped proud men dig out the black gold and provide for their families, they lay silent, rusting, forgotten. Monuments to men and a way of life of a bygone era. The highway, it's lonely now. The sound of big diesel engines, infrequent. A few cars now and then, people with places to go. In the past 20 years, the coal fields of southeastern Kentucky and West Virginia has dropped dramatically from 30 million tons in 2000 to less than 5 million in 2019. The tipples show this decline vividly. Most sit idle, and the few that still operate have minimal activity. This decline is reflected in the windows of the shops along the streets of little towns like Barberville, Corbin, and Harlan, Kentucky. The shops sit empty, abandoned, buildings falling into disarray. The pawn shops and payday loans, they prey upon those without resources. So, this war on poverty 
After spending $25 trillion in 60 years, it doesn't appear to me that the government is winning. And sometimes I wonder if that was ever the goal at all. These rich men north of Richmond, or in many cases, the county seat, for some, I believe it's beyond their ability to comprehend their fellow man's plight, calling him lazy or just uneducated. For others, the tragedy of this hillbilly is only a tool to collect taxes, make a profit, and spread the wealth, ultimately to other rich men. Do these programs really offer true relief, or are they a road out of poverty, or do they continue to keep people in the hollows, just enough help to prevent them from setting out and finding their fortune, just enough to be content. I can't blame the young people for leaving, and I can't blame those who stay. I can't even blame the ones that sit on their front porch day after day, content with their monthly government stipend. It's been this way since the 1940s, really. People have been traveling to this part of Appalachia since the 1960s to make a buck off of poverty or make political promises to deliver us from what they regard as poverty, make fun of our southern accent or hollow dialect, without acknowledging the kindness and generosity of the people that are here or their contributions that they've made to society. Consider Francis Gary Powers, the U-2 CIA pilot shot down over Russia in 1960. George Devil, who built the first industrial robot in 1954. Isaac Schwang, born in Corbin, Kentucky, an inventor who realized the first quantum computer. John Fetterman, who wrote this book, Stinking Creek, a Kentucky native born in Danville, and many more. If you want to cover Appalachia and the poverty here, the people, at least also recognize our contributions to mankind. Guys, until next time, be safe, be a good human. Take care.